Today's khutbah is dedicated to some lessons drawn from uh, a little less than two ayat of Surah An-Nur. These ayat talk about the principles by which we should understand the institution not only of marriage but how to get people married in society. Allah Azza wa Jal is actually, you know, أَبْلَغُ الْمُتَكَلِّمِينَ Nobody speaks more eloquently than Allah Azza wa Jal does. And in just a few words, He's captured pretty much an entire world view of how Muslim community and Muslim families are supposed to think about getting their sons and daughters married. And it's not only about getting your own sons and daughters married, as a matter of fact. When these ayat were revealed, there were a lot of people that had just become Muslim. So they did not have Muslim families. There, there were women, Whose, you know, whose parents were not Muslim, they were not supportive of them, these are Sahabiyat now, and they're not married, or they came out of a marriage and they have a child, etc. There are these situations that are conventional, where you, know, you have a son or a daughter and they grow up and they're of age and you're thinking about getting them married. But our, fa our larger family is the Ummah, right? Allah calls the entire Ummah, in one, you know, the Messenger will call it one body, the Quran will call it Ikhwa, blood brothers pretty much. We're, we're brethren among ourselves, which means we're one large family. So when people in our community, men and women can't get married, that's also our problem. That's something that falls on all of our shoulders collectively. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ Get the unmarried among them married. So where, where the statement begins. Aim in the Arabic language can be used for a woman, it can be used for a man. More commonly actually it was used for women and less so it was used for men. It seems in the, from the usage of the Arabs, it indicates it's talking about men that ha are having a hard time finding a wife. Or men that are in a sense sometimes also refusing to get married, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Encourage them to get married, right? Uh, no, but on the other hand, it's actually majority of the cases of the word, the use of the word is talking about women. Women that have been previously married or are, are divorced, women that, are, that were never married before, women that have come from other families and have now become Muslim, etc, etc. Those are the women that are being talked about. And what's, what's really interesting, the first thing I'd like to highlight here, is often not talked about, Allah Azza wa Jal actually highlighted um, divorced women first. He highlighted divorced women first. And of the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, actually preference is given. And the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to marry divorced women or widows. That's actually a sunnah of our messenger والسلام, A sunnah that has now almost become the opposite. When somebody thinks about marrying somebody who's previously divorced or somebody who's widowed, it's like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You know? And this is the exact opposite of the legacy of our messenger والسلام, As a matter of fact, in the ayah where Allah told his messenger that he may re replace his wives with other wives, he mentioned thayyibatin wa abkara. He mentioned the women, uh, I will get him married to other women that were previously married first. He mentioned them and then abkara. And then the, the ones that are virgins, the ones that have never married before. So even in the sequencing of the Quran, many mufassirun will highlight this, that Allah gave preference to those that were previously married because that is, uh, these are people that can become forgotten easily in a society. And in the ummah, we don't forget people, we don't leave people behind. Now as an imperative, <laughs> When Allah says, get young people married, or get non-married people married, allow them to get married, this is a broad commandment. And who does it apply to? You would think it applies to people, okay, once this boy has graduated from school, once he's got a good job, once he's got a good amount of savings, once he's got you know, a little bit of the return on investment paid back to his parents, you know, once he's done all this, 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 and this, and once, you know, everybody else in the family is taken care of, then we'll think about getting him married because if we get him married right now, all of his attention will go to his wife. We're not gonna get anything. So we need, this is our son, this is our investment. We need to get our money's worth first before we allow him to get married. And even when we do get married, this needs to not just be a matter of our material gain, this is a matter of family pride. We need to make sure that someone that we can show off you know, someone that we can be proud of and take lots of pictures and invite, you know, have a huge gathering ceremony and be able to show that we married in, a, in an upper class family, et cetera, et cetera. So the considerations for how you get somebody married, you put age restrictions on your, your men and your women as a matter of fact. And for women, it's the exact opposite. In many families, the moment she turns into a teenager, they start getting like, I need to, I need to, 
you know, get rid of my responsibility. I need to just, it's like a disease in your home that you want to just get rid of. That you want to throw this girl out. And there, there, there are young women that are depressed because their fathers and their mothers, all they talk about is you're still sitting at home. You're not getting married. You're still sitting at home. And on the other hand, the opposite is these young men that want to get married. And the parents say, no, not yet. You're not ready. You're not ready. Look at what the ayah does. وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ Even get good, the good among your slave men and women. Back then, there was a slave society too. And the people that are making virtually no money are the slaves. Allah says, get them married too. So the rationale that somebody has to be at a certain economic status before you think about marriage was crushed by one statement, removed from the equation. The only thing mentioned in the equation is, are they, are they of the age? Should they be married? And the second is they're salihin, they're good people. Good means they're good with Allah, also means they're mature, they're ready. They're, they're of the age. وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ And then Allah Azza wa Jal adds to that, because there are people who still consider these matters. إِنْ يَكُونُوا فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِهِمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ If they happen to be bankrupt, if they don't have a lot of money, don't worry, that's not your problem. Allah will give them wealth from His own blessing. Because bankruptcy to Allah is a lesser problem. But Aima, Aima means lots of people in society that are not married. That's a much bigger problem. Not having money is a less problem. But not having people tied down in healthy relationships, that's a much, much bigger problem to Allah. You know, when I was studying this word, I even found a narration, أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَتَعَوَّذُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مِنَ الْأَيْمَةِ Rasulullah Wasallam used to actually seek refuge from a society with a lot of single people. He used to be worried about the ummah becoming people, a lot of single people just happy the way they are. And they're not happy the way they are, it's just that their families kept pushing them candidates that they're not interested in. And the one they wanted to marry, they're not allowed to marry. And so they say, whatever, I'll just stay single. And you know, when somebody says, I stay single, doesn't mean I stay an angel. Let's, under, let's be very clear what that means. If there's a 30 year old, and he's a professional, and he's making good money, and she's 29 years old or 28 years old, and she's graduated from school, and she's not married, that does not mean temptation hasn't come to them, sin hasn't come their way, that they've just, they've just lived this pious life like they're living in the city of Medina back in the day. And by the way, even the city of Medina had its issues. The city of Medina had pretty crazy situations. If you study the life of the Prophet ﷺ carefully, and what, what happened with the companions around, stuff happened. I mean, I was just this morning, I was reading about the narration of a Sahabi who went back to Mecca and he used to have literally a girlfriend. The words in the narration are Khalila, a girlfriend, back before he became Muslim. And she saw him and she goes, Malak, what's wrong with you? Don't you want to be alone with me again? Literally, that's what she said. And he said, well, that's, there's Islam between you and me now. That's what he said. And she got mad at him and she got her brothers and friends to beat him up. And he says, fine, okay, the only way for us now is I have to marry you. And she says, fine, marry me. He goes, I have to ask the Prophet first. Because he doesn't know if he can marry someone who's a non-Muslim. So he goes back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he asks him, and then the ayat came down, that tanqihul mushrikat. You know, don't marry mushrik women until they believe. If she wants to accept Islam, fine. If not, then no. You know, if she wants to leave her pagan, pagan ways, then fine. But I digress from the point. The point, the first point I wanted to make is, how do we make marriage easy? Because this is something, this is the way of shaitan. You know what the way of shaitan is? The way of shaitan in a society is, you make the haram easy, and you make the halal difficult. That, and when that happens in a society, shaitan is one. Because people will gravitate towards what is easy. So today, if you want pleasure for your eyes, what can you capture on a screen, where the places you can go, the access that you have at, at your workplace, at your campuses, you know, on your mobile devices, on social media platforms, on dating apps, you name it. All of that has become easy. And while the door to haram, to fulfill, because human beings, men will have desire for women, that's something Allah put inside them. It's not gonna go away. Women will want companionship. It's something Allah put inside, it's in their nature. That's why families come together anyway. When that is the door to the unhealthy, the, the filthy, the impermissible is wide open. And then that young man comes to his parents and says, I think I need to get married. I know I'm only in my third year of college, but this is getting out of hand, mom. This is getting out of hand, dad. I think, I, and he doesn't say, dad, my hormones are driving me crazy. Man, the girls on campus, I don't even know what to tell you. Seriously though, 
you know, this one girl keeps texting me out. He's not going to talk like that to his dad or his mom. He's just going to say, Mom, I think I need to get married. He's going to code it in a nice way. And then what do parents do? They humiliate this young man. Oh, can't hold it in, huh? Can't control yourself? Well, I was 40 when I got married and your father starts giving you lectures, you know? <laughs> like, how are you 40? You're 50 now. <laughs> you know? So what we've done as parents oftentimes is oppress and suppress what naturally Allah put inside of us, especially in a time when the haram is wide open, then you have to go out of your way to make the halal easy. You have to go out of your way and you can only battle the haram by, by opening the doors to the halal. And to be able to say to our young men and women, this door is open for you. Before you ever even think about making a mistake, come talk to us, let us know. Look, your family pride, you know, you wanted, to, you wanted your son or daughter to marry somebody within the, within the race, within the city, within the village, you know, within the extended cousins, God knows what, what you had in mind for them. You had all these dreams for them. If you wanted to have them marry within the village, why didn't you stay in the village? Why did you bring them here? Why did you let them go to college? Why did you let them, why did you let them see the world? You didn't put, you were trying to pretend that the world is still what it was. It's not. The world has changed. The world was even different from the Makkah and Sahaba when they moved to Medina. The Sahaba noticed these are not like women of Makkah. This is different. Society was different for them. When people migrate, there's a new society. And we have to adapt to that. And to refuse to accept that is a form of oppression. It actually goes against the ayah that says, allow people to get married open that door up which comes to the next point when some proposal comes your way you have daughters like i have daughters may allah azza wa help all of us who have daughters you know oh, and sons too i'll throw them in the dark but you know like <laughs> but if the if you have daughters and some proposal comes she's of the age it's a good match she likes him it's okay to ask do you like him it's not it's not haram to ask it's actually an important thing to ask do you like him she says, I don't like how he looks. Done, finished. You can't force them anymore. I don't like, I'm not attracted to him. Astaghfirullah, that will come. Allah will put it in your heart. No, it won't. That's not how it works. If she says, I don't like him, he's too fat, he's too short, he's ugly. I'm, you know, I don't like his personality. Whatever she says, she doesn't even have to give you a reason. She doesn't, she could just say no, that's it. And by the way, later on in this ayah, I won't get time to get to it, but I'll, I'll just refer to the phrase, وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَى Don't force your young girls to rebellion. That's the phrase in the Qur'an. Don't force your wrong, young girls to rebellion. And the immediate inter interpretation actually of it was, don't make young women go into prostitution. Because in Medina, that's what they did with slave women. They used them for, for, to make money off of them as pimps, and they used to literally pimp them in the streets. That's what they did. And Quran came and spoke against that. But the phrasing Allah used wasn't just about prostitution. He made it wide open. Why is it wide open? When you force a woman to get married to someone she doesn't want to marry, when you put you know, emotional pressure on her and say, if you don't marry him, nobody's gonna marry you. Your family's gonna be humiliated. We've already printed the cards. When you do this kind of thing to your girls and you get them married, and then emotionally they're not in that marriage. They're still human beings. A human being still needs companionship. A human being still wants somebody who, who they can be attracted to, who they can find comfort in. That desire does not go away. And that desire will now be fulfilled by fantasy, by them thinking about things, by late night going on social media, by other things. You force them into rebelling against Allah because you force them into a marriage they didn't want to begin with. This is la tukrihu fatayatikum ala al also. Don't push this on your, on your daughters. But coming back, this is about men and about women. The young men of our community actually have to now stand up for themselves and have to say, I'm ready to get married. And I have somebody in mind. And that's, that's the next thing I want to share with you. You know, when it comes to, you want a marriage that lasts forever. Like we want, a, we want our boy to have the perfect girl. Good luck with that, by the way. Uh, because perfection is not gonna happen in this, and your boy isn't perfect. Let me, let me tell you, if you don't know, let me tell you. We're all human beings, and human beings have flaws, and sometimes, sometimes things work, and sometimes things don't work. But let me tell you, when a young man and a young woman are old enough to get married, that actually means they're old enough to make their own choice. Let me repeat myself. 
when they're old enough to get married, they're old enough to make their own choice. And maybe you don't like their choice. And your job and my job as parents is to advise them and say, I don't think this is a good choice. I think that this is, you could do better. I, and, and you're, by the way, as a parent, I think I'm always going to say you could do better. I'm always going to say that. But maybe, and maybe you think this is a mistake. But if your son is 25 years old, your daughter is 30 years old, and she wants to make a mistake, that halal mistake is way better. That halal mistake is way, way, and it, maybe things don't work out in three years. That's still better. That's still better than you refusing because I have seen enough cases. I don't talk in theory. I'm talking based on what I've seen, the conversations I've had with people, with real Muslim families around the world, especially around the United States and Canada, where people are, this, this man comes and says, I want to marry this girl. The father says, no, you're not from the same country. You're not from the same culture or whatever. You can't get married to my daughter or the other way around. But these two are still already emotionally attached. So they're texting each other, talking to each other, hanging out with each other, having dinner with each other. Parents don't know. Five, six years go by. They're refusing other proposals. Then the girl is forced to marry somebody else and she's still talking to the guy. And all of this was that, that evil, that evil, that this whoever she married didn't deserve this. He didn't deserve this. But all of that evil was created by the stubbornness of parents who didn't realize that their children live in a different time. Where, where allowing marriage first is a bigger priority than anything else. You have to understand when these ayat came down, they came down in Medina. And the Arab people are a, of the time especially were very tribal. They wanted to maintain their nasab at all cost. You maintain your lineage. Lineage is a very, very big deal. So marrying outside your tribe was not a common thing. But now the Sahaba are in Medina and they're outcasts from their own city anyway. And a lot of the people that were in Medina, they've accepted Islam, so they're outcasts from their own tribes. So there are going to be marriages outside of their culture. You have to understand, it's not just an Arab marrying an Arab. This is a Hudhali marrying someone from Ta'if or somebody, you know, there's all this inter-tribal marriage happening, which is a big deal to them. It's as big a deal today than a Pakistani marrying a Bangladeshi, astaghfirullah al You know? Or a Lebanese marrying an Egyptian. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. How can that be? You know? This, this was a big deal to them. But Allah said, no, forget all of that. Just make sure that marriage itself becomes easy. Just that much. And Allah will take care of the rest. And before I conclude this khutbah, just one phrase from the next ayah. وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُنَا نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ That's a tough ayah. For all the young women, men and women that are here, especially the women, sorry, especially the men, Allah says, you better try to hold on as best as you can away from the haram. Isti'faf comes from iffa. Iffa is al-kaffu an al-haram walaw kana yajmulu. They say to stay away from haram, even though haram is really beautiful, really tempting. That's called iffa. Isti'faf is mubalagha of it. Do your hardest, do your best to stay away from the impermissible, no, no matter how tempting, how beautiful, how emotionally you know, attractive it becomes, how justified it becomes in your mind. Stay away from it as best you can. Those of you that cannot find a means to get married, لا يجدون نكاحن because that temptation is going to eat up. You'll be a believer on the outside. And when it comes to this kind of behavior, Iman is out the window. Remember the words of your Prophet ﷺ. When somebody commits adultery, when somebody does the ultimate shameless act, at the time they're doing it, they're no longer a believer. They're no longer a believer. This is the words of our Prophet ﷺ. You better hold on and protect yourself from the road to haram. The first moment you find the opportunity to take the halal option, you take it. You take it. And our, the, the first notice in these ayat, the first conversation was actually to the community and to the society. They were supposed to make things easier. And by the way, today in our times, that is the role of the masjid. Where are good Muslims going to meet other good Muslims? You tell me, at the mall? Where are they going to meet? At the hookah place? Where, where are they going to find each other? If our families, families, men, women, children, if they start coming to the masajid, then families start getting to know each other and connections start forming. That is actually one of the fundamental roles of the masjid, especially in a society where the majority of the people are not believers. That's what's supposed to happen. 
It's okay if somebody saw outside after Juma, somebody was going to park their car and some young man saw some woman and said, oh, mom, can you find out about her? It's completely fine. Actually, it's better. It's better that happens here than anywhere else. That's actually the case. You know, you find in our history, there were, there were women that used to run orphanages in Medina. Women muhaddithat would run orphanages and they would take the, the, these orphan girls, it's a girl's orphanage, there are no fathers. Nobody's gonna go look for a nikah for them or a you know, possible match for them or a proposal for them. Nobody knows they exist, they're orphans. So this, this muhaditha, this scholar used to take, in Medina, she used to take all these orphan girls, 18, 19, 20 year old girls, she'd take them out shopping every day to get groceries. You don't need 20 girls to go groceries, but she would. Why would she do that? And then people started complaining, there's fitna in the street, in the market, all these young girls outside. You know, people say this nowadays, there's a big fitna at the Islamic convention, all these young girls in the bazaar, astaghfirullah al -Azim. You don't, you don't complain fitna in the movie theater. You've never complained fitna in the mall. You've never complained fitna on campus. At the Islamic convention, there's fitna. Everywhere else is, uh, you know, uh, Allah just opened the blessings for you. MashaAllah, they went shopping, you know. So people complain, there's fitna. And what did she say? Why do you do this? She said, Li atasayyada bihinna shabab al Medina. So I can hunt down the young men of Medina. Because when she goes shopping for carrots, the guy at the cash register is going to fall in love and say, I want to find out about her. And he's going to marry, because who's going to marry these orphan girls? Who's going to marry them if, they know, if nobody's even seen them? Nobody's ever even been interested in them. There are legitimate ways by people getting introduced to each other. Some of us are so conservative, we're so protective of our women that we want them to become invisible. That is not the way Medina operated. And some of us are so liberal and so open. Oh yeah, they want to go out to dinner, go ahead. Oh, just come back before midnight. Really? That's insane. What are you, what are you thinking? What are you doing? This is not, the khalwa is open doors for shaitan. So we've got these two extremes and now we've got to come back to the middle. Allow young people to meet in a dignified fashion with the knowledge of their families. And if there is mutual interest, then it's okay. They can express it. And I want to leave you with one last thing, even though I've talked about it many times before, just as a reminder for myself and for all of you. The only marriage proceedings mentioned in the Quran are that of Musa alayhi salam. Like from zero to 100, like finding a girl and getting married to a girl. You know, that whole spectrum is captured in the story of Musa alayhi salam. Just a few things about that. First and foremost, he's, a, he's from Banu Israel, yes? He's an Israelite. And he is homeless. He's a fugitive from the law. He ran from Egypt because he accidentally killed someone. So he's homeless, he's an Israelite, he's a fugitive. He ends up in an Arab, Arab tribe. He ends up in Arab land where he finds a couple of girls and he helps them. And one of the girls indirectly told her father she's interested in him. And the father immediately said yes. And they got married. So an Israeli got married to an Arab in the Quran. And the one from Israel was also homeless and a fugitive from the law. The only thing the father needed to see was three things. One, the girl's interested. That was number one. She liked him. Number two, he's strong. He's got good character, good qualities in him. He can do a job, he can make money, he can defend my family. And then he's trustworthy. He had plenty of opportunity to do the wrong thing, he did no such thing, he carried himself with dignity. When you have these three qualities, ethnicity didn't matter, financial status didn't matter, none of that mattered. None of that mattered. As a matter of fact, in this case, if nowadays when you say this, it sounds suicidal, for 10 years, between eight and 10 years, Musa salam lived with his in-laws and worked for his father-in-law. And his paycheck came from his in-laws. Today, when you say to somebody, hey, where do you work? Oh, I work for my father-in-law and I live with them too. <laughs> well, what a, what a guy, this is a real man. This is a man even, he lives with his in-laws. You want to question the manhood of Musa salam? Try what, see what happens to you. Because you don't want to get punched by that man, alayhi salam. What I'm saying is there are sometimes unusual situations. And Allah mentions them on purpose in the Quran because sometimes the marriage is going to be under unusual situations. Not every situation can be ideal. And in your family, if there's an unusual situation, don't sit there and cry, why couldn't we have a normal kind of situation? That's okay. Life is not about normal. 
actually when you dig deep in every family there's no such thing as normal every one of us is weird every one of us has strange situations in their family so we have to adapt and we have to be flexible and we have to be merciful to our coming generation allowing them to get married in a healthy way and having that open conversation with our sons and with our daughters may allah azza wa jal bless this community with healthy marriages may allah azza wa jal allow us to do right by our children and our children to do right by their children in raising children on islam barakallahu li wa lakum fil qur'an al hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al hakim